So what I'll be talking about, um, there's been years of work on the water quantity um, or the ability of these stormwater control measures to control water quantity. And similar to the temperature analysis, I want to look at more uh, from a water quality point of view. That's just my background when I came here and I was happy to uh, help out. And in particular, I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about nutrient and metals removal in, uh, the, in a bioinfiltration uh, SCM system. Okay, the goals. First off, when coming here, I mean, if you're going to design something, um, you need to understand what's, what are, what's going on. Is it re uh, reducing the amount of pollutants? By how much? And by what mechanism? So, I mean, we need to know that first before we can go to the next step. And the next step from a very practical point is, how can we use the above information to determine how these things can operate or how we can maximize their operation, minimize their maintenance, with the goals of answering questions like, how long will they last? For metals removal, will they only last three seasons? Or will they last way beyond what we can envision um, the lifespan of these systems to be? So that's the main questions. You know, and if we know how long they'll last, what can we do to prolong their useful life? So that's kind of the big picture where we came on. I'm just going to show a little bit of work um, on how uh, we went about doing that. Okay, so the first, whenever I mention nutrients, by that I mean nitrogen, phosphorus. Those are the two biggies that uh, are a major concern. I mean, they're a concern on the Chesapeake, Long Island Sound, you know, um, and a variety of systems, lakes. We'll go into the why in detail. But excess, nu nutri excess nutrients can be a problem. How do they end up in stormwater runoff? Fertilizers. You know, have nutrients in it. That's why you add the fertilizers to excess. Not, that, uh, not a good thing. Uh, leaves and grass clippings. Pollen, believe it or not. At certain times of the year, you'll see a spike in the nitrogen and phosphorus because of the pollen. Uh, detergents used for washing your cars. I just was kind of thinking as we went through here. Uh, animal waste, you know, can be, you're not picking up after Rover. Um, or it could also be that huge goose population. The birds. We'll leave it at that. Uh, but anyway, what? Pigeons. Pigeons, yes. Oh, pigeons, that's what. So, you know, there's a, and I'm sure I missed a few. There's a variety of ways where uh, the stormwater runoff can be polluted with nitrogen and phosphorus. Why do we care about this? You know, aren't nutrients, isn't that good? It's great if you're algae. And uh, having too much nitrogen and phosphorus will cause excess algal growth, will cause eutrophication systems to occur. And from that, I mean, if you've ever, in the middle of the summer, looked at a lake that during the winter looked nice and clear, but in the summer, you know, had a nice green growth to it, the lake has excess nutrients in it, uh, or your water body. Typically, lakes are phosph uh, phosphorus limited, uh, oceans, estuaries, nitrogen limited. So on where you go. So you can imagine the excess algal growth, if that's a, a lake for swimming, doesn't really look that appetizing if you want to go, uh, or um, you know, I don't really want to jump in. There. So from the aesthetics point of view, there are negatives. But uh, I would even say in a more important uh, aspect of it, it can really affect the dissolved oxygen concentrations. What happens is, yes, the excess nutrients cause the algal blooms to occur. That's actually good. You know, for oxygen, because algae produce oxygen, that's what they do. So when I go to sample a lake, if it's a hot summer day and there's a lot of uh, al algae in the water, I'll put my probe in there and the oxygen concentrations will be way higher than I would have expected under natural conditions. The only problem is, you know, the sun's, if the sun's not out, they don't grow. And at night, well during the day it happens too, but at night is where the problem comes through is basically they're just sitting ducks for uh, bacteria in the water. And the bacteria consume the algae. As they're consuming the algae, they use up uh, the oxygen. So you have a diurnal effect, and it's a you know, relatively natural effect. And what can happen is if there's too much algae during the day, and the conditions are right, it doesn't always happen, uh, but you can have low dissolved oxygen at night, and if it's too low, it can have a negative impact on the fish. And we're talking like, you know, fish floating on the surface. It, it's, uh, and why, I mean, that's why we should all care about it. I'm a very selfish person. Why do I care about it? One of the lakes I like to go fishing at has a problem with eutrophication. 
And this is actually a lake I volunteer to help sample. This is actually up. What is that on your head? That is my proud New York Yankees hat. I'm a, also a native of Ray Park as well. Yeah, we're, we're slow. Um, but we are, and this is actually, you may know this, this is up at Mohegan Lake. So this is northern Westchester County. Um, it's a lake up there. And this is taken in about, I would say, April. And we see, of course, everyone take a look at that. It's a big fish for that lake. But what we should be looking at is the surrounding water. It was nice and clear. But what happens is at this particular lake, as maybe July, August, just one big green mat. And as a fly fisherman, it's really hard to get the fly out and actually catch something in a really big green mat. So for years, I've shown this, and this is the reason why I do it. My reasons for being concerned about this have even improved or increased. <laughs> this is my seven-year-old daughter with her first fish caught in April. Love it when it was nice and clear like this. And uh, for any parents out there, when your kid is happy, you're happy. So I have personal reasons why uh, I want to know why is this occurring in this particular lake. And from a big um, aspect, in other water bodies as well. So that's just why I care. Okay, for metals, the metals, uh, I mean, there's many metals out there. The ones we're particularly uh, concerned with when stormwater runoff lead, cadmium, chromium, copper, and zinc. Uh, at least those are the ones we measure, those are the ones that we find in high concentrations. How do they make it in stormwater runoff? You know, most, a lot of it's vehicles, uh, either exhaust, brake linings, tires and engine wear, just natural wear and tear in your car. Um, hence why we like the faculty parking lots, the older cars, because uh, that's where, you know, we see more of the influence. And also, you know, metal roofs and gutters, things like that. You know, so that's where the metals can make it in there. Uh, so that's where the metals come in. Uh, what I want to do is this, we've seen this before, this is, are you going to take them over to the yes. West Campus? So you will see this campus, uh, this uh, stormwater control measure. We have stormwater runoff coming from uh, parking lot, the surrounding area, kind of enters here. You can see it during a rain event, ponding up. Uh, even if it is raining outside, there's so much vegetation in there now, you may not even be able to see if there's ponding, but uh, this, this is what it looks like. So we wanted to look and see, well, how are we doing? Are we removing some of these nutrients? Are we removing the metals? And um, you showed a similar slide in this, but I mean, this is this was a wonderful site when I first came here. I was like, this is great. This was built in 2001, uh, continuous sampling, I think since 03. And not only have we been sampling it constantly, but we've intensively been sampling it. What we collect, this is our ponded water sample up here, you know, just where ponds during a rain event. Uh, we collect samples uh, coming in, we collect any samples going out, but we also, beneath the surface, so here's the surface of our infiltration bed. Uh, the infiltration bed itself is just 50% uh, sand, 50% native soil that was uh, packed in here. And so it's a 1.2 meter or 4 foot bed. We collect uh, pore water samples, so uh, we can collect the, as the water infiltrates down, we can get a snapshot of what the concentrations are at the surface, at the bottom of the infiltration bed, four feet down, and then even four feet below that, or eight feet from the surface, we can also collect samples. So this was good, and I wanted to see, well, as the water infiltrates through the system, are the metals going down, and why? And is that the major loss mechanism? Same thing with phosphorus. So that's, that's where we're going with. I started with uh, phosphorus first, uh, just because phosphorus was a low-hanging fruit uh, for me, anyway, <laughs> from an analysis point of view. And particularly, I'm looking at phosphate, which is the bioavailable form of phosphorus. This is what is, affects the algae. This is what they take up. And what we have, the black, is ponded water. This is when the infiltration bed, above the infiltration bed, there's standing water. We just collect samples either at the beginning or at the end of uh, the rain event. Z equals zero is the surface of the infiltration bed. The blue square is at the bottom of the infiltration bed. And the red circle is four feet below that. And what I did, um, basically, I mean, the concentrations vary from storm to storm, from year to year. There's really no way to look at uh, just because every storm is different. You know, there's, and the duration, the dry spell between storms is different. There's so many variables going on, it's very tough to uh, analyze it. So to try to simplify it, all I did and exceed this probability, I just ranked from lowest to highest in concentration once. So this is the lowest concentrations, these were the highest. And it was just a way of kind of looking at the different systems. 
And then we look at the halfway point, the medium value. And what did we get? We see that in the ponded water sample, we're about 0.2 milligrams per liter of phosphate. At the bottom of the infiltration bed, this is the blue square, we're at 0 0.03. So almost an order of magnitude decrease in the phosphate concentration. So that's good. And also what was interesting, when you go four feet below that, it was essentially the same concentration. So as you go eight, four feet below the infiltration bed, it didn't change. So all of the phosphate removal is occurring in that four foot bed itself. I actually don't even time to show it. It's actually only occurring in like the first four inches is where all the phosphate removal is occurring, which is similar to metals. Metals removal, it's, all, it's occurring in, in the top surfaces as well. So now we know there is removal. What I wanted to see is, can I do a mass balance? We're engineers. We like mass balances. So I wanted to see, we already know the stormwater going in and going out. We measured the phosphate concentrations for many years. And from that, the amount of phosphate that entered this system, the entire rain garden, but did not leave during that time was 1.9 kilograms. So now I want to see, well, where did it go? I know uh, that phosphate likes to stick to soil, particularly it likes to stick to the calcium, um, yeah, calcium, aluminum, iron in the soil as well. And I'm going to say first off, let's just look at the soil, uh, the soil, sorting to the soil, just sticking to the soil as it moves through. I just looked at the first foot, and I found that 1.6 kilograms of the phosphate was stuck to the soil. I just took soil samples out, extracted them in the lab, and measured the concentration. So we have 1.6 kilograms sorbed to the soil, 1.9 difference between in and out, phosphate unaccounted for 0.3 kilograms. I only measured the first foot because the majority of the, sort, uh, the phosphate is just in the first uh, couple inches, but there, the bottom three feet there could have been some phosphate sorption. Um, I neglected evapotranspiration, sorry, Bridget. Um, and it's in infiltration systems itself, I looked in literature. They said, you know, between 3 and 20% is the uh, loss due to evapotranspiration in these type of systems. 16 is between 3 and 20. Maybe it's all evapotranspiration. Regardless of the loss mechanism, I was psyched to get a mass balance within 16%. I mean, I was hoping for 100%. If, you know, so 16% was, when you're comparing such a natural environment, looking at it from different ways, I was pretty psyched with, uh, with those results. So what this shows is that the, the majority of the phosphate loss is due to sticking to the soil. Now I got greedy, and I wanted to see, can I estimate how long this infiltration bed will last? It's already lasted 9 years, uh, actually 11 years. Can it last a uh, how much longer beyond that? So we have soil extractions, and they show we know how much phosphate soared on the soil between the, the um, operation of the rain garden. Therefore, I was able to estimate a rate, like how many grams per year was sorbing to the soil. It's an estimate, but yeah, let's see what we can do. And then I did batch absorption experiments in the lab where I looked at equilibrium, how much phosphate could the soil hold. And I wanted to compare, is, the, is it fault? Can the, you know, is the soil, can the, the, can the soil hold any more or did it already meet it, its maximum? What my analysis showed was that the first 10 centimeters, what, 4 inches, was saturated with phosphate. But remember, it's a 4 foot bed and I put greater than 20 years, it's going to be much greater than 20 years that the infiltration bed will last under these conditions with regard to phosphate. Um, and just conclusions from what we have here. Uh, phosphate sorbs in the soil was the major loss mechanism to the phosphate. The majority of the phosphate sorption occurred in the first, you know, couple inches of the system. And more importantly, since it was uh, started, there's been no decrease in its removal potential, which I think is incredible. And also, based on you know comparisons of from different angles with batch experiments and field data, uh, infrequent maintenance is needed with respect to phosphate. Maybe for other sources, you will need maintenance, but at least for phosphate, you don't need that. And this is actually, if you're curious, uh, this is in this month's issue of Journal of Environmental Engineering, which just came out, so if you want to learn more, I, I, I went through it. We will autograph a copy for you. <laughs>
And then they don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so quickly now before I end, what I just did for phosphate, now I want to do for um, uh, metals. And here's just one. Here's copper at the surface, medium value 8.2, at the bottom 4.9 parts per billion, micrograms per liter. So there is a loss mechanism there. When I went out and I looked in the, uh, at the soil samples, I took soil samples and I extracted the metal from the soil. The blue is our control area, the red is our infiltration zone. We are seeing buildup of the copper. Now does this buildup correlate with the loss? And, or, you know, or is plant uptake a major source or not? You know, so this is the next point. Figure out and then do some um, equilibrium analysis to see is the soil saturated with, with these metals already or can it hold more? And that will, that's of course, you know, maintenance concerns. How much will it build up before it becomes, you know, now you have to treat it differently. So you, maybe you want to take, remove the top layer uh, over a certain amount of time. So those are things to go for. And then definitely when I say I, 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 I mean my students uh, went out and did that. So it's important that they get their um, due and then of course the funding agencies. <laughs>